Right, um, so um, I'll just introduce myself very quickly. Uh, my name's uh, Phil Cooper. I am the CIO and Director for Sterling Geo. I will attempt to speak very slowly for our fabulous translators in the booth in there who I've been listening to. Um, and if I say anything they don't understand or can't translate, they can come and beat me up afterwards. Um, CIO, by the way, stands for Chief Innovation Officer, just if anyone wanted to know. So um, we are a small business uh, in the UK. Uh, we're very focused on uh, geospatial solutions. We take uh, the power of geography. Uh, and being, I think, one of the few geographers in this room, I've been delighted by the amount of maps and geospatial data represented so far. To be in a room with so many economists and town planners and have so much geography warms the cockles of my heart. <laughs> She's going to struggle with that one. Um, but one of the things that we focus on is, is linking data together and exposing accurate, actionable information. That's the focus of the business. Um, the company has been in existence uh, in its current form since 2011. We've been growing at a rate of about 28% year on year. Um, and really where we are focused is around the utilization um, of uh, software technology to expose the value of data. One of the focuses within the business I run and look after has been moving from the paradigm shift of desktop technology to the use of the cloud. And this is going to be extremely important as everybody, not just the current generation of geographers and users of spatial data, but the next generation as well. The days of people sitting in the corner of an office with one desktop computer, with all the GIS software on and all the data on, is just gone. It's going. It's disappearing out the door. And it has to. Because the cloud is here to help us and the tools are here to help us as well. Just a quick reference to a company that we are working with at the moment, a company called Living Planet, uh, and they, they've allowed me to use one of their slides because actually I find this slide extremely impactful. The battle for our planet will be won or lost in our cities. If you look at the figures that we're going to see 75%, 80% of all population living in urban areas and cities by 2050, we have to start getting it right now. And there, are, there is no choice. Now, the cities that we habit, inhabit are very, very different, and they all have totally different requirements, whether it's a developed city like Milton Keynes, whether it's a developing city like Dar el Salaam in, in, in Africa, they are still have challenges and issues. But actually, this is where data can help. The point I'm going to focus on is why is change measurement so important? Monitoring is important because we need clarity and accuracy. I was talking last night with some of the, the colleagues from the, from the Planning Institute about the fact that there is an awful lot of noise out there. There is an awful lot of data that's utter rubbish. I know there is even, let's, let's call it fake data, shall we? That's a that's good, uh, good trending term at the moment. There's an awful lot of fake data. So it is as important to filter out the useful information as it is to get rid of the rubbish. What can we do with satellite imagery? How can we use satellite imagery to help? I've got a couple of examples that we've worked on. Oh, not that one. <laughs> oh, we've got a little... Okay. Oops. So in this instance, this is a devastation of the tornadoes in Alabama. One image, second image. We can actually get a lot of information from that. Look at the extent of the damage. The earthquake in Japan. This is, I think, one of the most impactful satellite image changes I've seen. Same location. This is where the power of geography starts to play into the thing. Here we go. Gone. Now, why is that going to be so important? Well, clearly, there's obviously the response, but also when they start the clear-up operation, what was the value of the infrastructure that's been destroyed? Where was it? Where was the infrastructure? What has changed? What is the information we need? How fast do we need that information to start responding to it? And actually, with satellite imagery and sensors with geography, we can start looking at data very, very quickly. Here again, as well, is another example of what was there and what suddenly wasn't. 
the level of detail we can achieve from satellite imagery now is extremely detailed. You can see cars in the car park, something that uh, Henny mentioned as well. You can even see there's a car door open. The problem was, 20 years ago when I was uh, first moving into the geospatial industry, we just couldn't access the data. Entire PhDs were written on a single satellite image. Now we have absolutely the opposite problem. We almost have too much data to work with. And that's the challenge that I think that we have to fo focus on. I like analogies. I like working with, um, which is that actually data is our fuel. And I like racing cars as well. It's a bad habit of mine. Um, so we have a lot of fuel. But as a business, what we have to do is create engines. Engines to process that fuel to allow you to get accurate, actionable information out. The sort of engines that we are using and deploying is we utilize Hexagon Geospatial, which is a GIS software company. They have a map enterprise toolkit. This is not a desktop software tool. You can start decoupling processes and capabilities, creating your own workflow that does one specific job and run it in the cloud. Once again, the days of running geospatial software of which you might only use 1%, those days are going. They have to go. Because you only want to do one thing, so only do one thing. If you're only looking at green space change, only look at green space change. The other tool that we have extensive use of is a product called FME. And FME allows us to do data conversion. Everybody has their own data format. Everybody likes to convert their own data structure. So we use the components within FME to build our engines. But there are exceptionally useful tools, things like Python scripting, which allow you to start connecting these engines together. Open source provides you with tools and engines that you can create. Stick these things together and you can start getting some fantastically powerful outputs. This is just a very quick example of how we work with these engines. What does it look like? What do I mean by an engine? Well, it's a visual interface. It's drag and drop. The people who we want to create engines should be ones that understand the problem and want to drag and drop it. Not coders, drag and drop tools and engines are that. So now we've got our engines, now let's have some apps. I've got a couple of examples just to run through of applications and products that we've been working on, real life examples. Whoops. Come on. First one is just data. 80% of people's time is looking for nothing. Here's a controversial statement. Because a lot of the time when you're searching for information, you're searching for reams and reams of nothing. Nothing has changed, but actually that in itself is something of value. This particular service basically monitors an area of interest on the earth, and it just notifies me when a new image or a new piece of data of value is available. That's all it does. That's an application. And if anybody was interested in having it, let me know. It costs us pennies to run this system. All we're doing is looking at a data set. Is something new there? If the answer is yes, email. If it's not, don't. That's it. Very, very simple. The application work we did with Milton Keynes, we used open source satellite imagery data, something called Landsat, Landsat 5 and Landsat 8, and we just monitored green space change. We looked at 1985 image, we generated a green grey analy analysis, ON blue for water, for those people who are interested in water in the room. We did the same thing in 2011, and then we did a green grey analyzer, and we looked at the change. I'm going to skip through the, the engine and how we create it. That's the engine. But the point is, once we've done it once, we can run that engine time and time again. Different data sets, same output. And we looked at the change in green space in Milton Keynes in a number of regions. And this was the output. And if I could just run you on, on the movie, so hopefully this will work. We'll just play that. So this was basically the work that we did with a catapult in Milton Keynes, allowing us to look at green space analysis. But this is a smart application. That's information. What has changed? Do I want to understand by region over a period of time? Do I want to understand by time? How much has grown? What's occurred here? This is business analytics. It's a term that you may have heard. Driven by geospatial data, which has come from satellite imagery. This is where 
the sort of lightweight applications that I mentioned at the start is going from. In this particular instance, what we were able to show the policymakers, there was a policy introduced in 2006, 2007 to actively increase green space in Milton Keynes. Do you know what? We can prove it. That was the output. That's the deliverable. And that was incredibly valuable, that process. But once we did it once, we then repeated it for 120 other local authorities in the UK because we got the engine right. And that was the output. And equally, the visualization is as important. How you portray this information to people is extremely valuable. Let me just go back onto the slides again. I'm conscious of time. But that, that's one example uh, of where we've done that. Now, in the same way, we apply the same technology, the same approach to a developing city in Dar el Salaam in Tanzania. They have a rapidly growing city. Two million people in 1995. Five million people in 2010. Seven million people in 2014. 25,000 people a month are turning up in this city. And they want to know where they're growing. Because what's interesting about this city is the growth is not in the centre, but on the periphery. One of my colleagues mentioned it earlier. And why do they need to know this? Because they need to map it. They need to send surveyors out there as fast as possible. And that's what they're doing. And this was actually giving, so we used a green grey analyzer, but the information, the use of it is being used in a different way. It's the same engine. And we looked at some very rapid changes in percentage growth, but also what the problem they've got there is the World Bank who we are working with on this need to understand where the infrastructure's got to go. Where does the transport network need to be thinking about? Where do we need to invest? If they're about to invest $220 million in this city, they've got to have a clue about where they need to look and where they need to start first. A couple of other quick examples, subsidence monitoring using satellite imagery. We work with the Coal Authority looking at subsidence change using satellite imagery. And we can see the shift over time, very, very fast. Simple business analytical tools to make decisions. Oops. Flood scene monitoring, we can use satellite imagery to monitor floods. There's some more engines, there's some more output, there's some more output. But fundamentally, what you produce is a little report or a message to your phone. This is some information. It's that tiny bit. What is it you want to present? And increasingly now, if, if we need to realize the value of geography, we have to think about what it is it we want to deliver at the far end. A couple of examples very quickly as well. Peterborough City in the UK. We looked at monitoring um, the number of traffic accidents in Peterborough City. Doesn't sound very exciting. And yet what popped out was at five o'clock on a Monday was clearly the most dangerous time to drive around Peterborough. Actually, if you drill into the data, if you drill into the information, a lot of accidents were happening on this roundabout. And do you know what? They could do something about it. But until you actually look at the data in a way that somebody can understand, they didn't know what was going on. And that was a really insightful piece of work we did with a dashboard and some business analytics. Six crashes, all about 30 miles per hour outside that railway station. Hmm. Maybe we want to do something about that. And then the last little bit is on um, crime mapping as well. Once again, it's just an example of how we took data and present it out so people can understand it. And you get some value very, very quickly from the process. And in the future, how we interact with systems and sensors and data sets, this is all going to change. With all this data, with all these engines, what I'm looking forward to is who is going to be working with that information next. My six-year-old daughter doesn't use keyboards. Do you know what she does? She touches the screen. So we have to think about how people are going to work with that data too. Thank you very much.